In this video, I'm going to go over how Gil may have harmonised the short passage, but then also voice it for a traditional big band. Gil Evans is known for his use of unconventional instruments. Earlier in his career with the Claude Thornhill Orchestra, he utilised some slightly more regular instrumentation. So here is the short passage I have written for this example. It's a simple repeated phrase over typical chords. I'm going to complete and discuss the first voicing in detail, and then continue on to the basic harmonisation of the passage. As you might know already, I like to do the target chords first, and this first D minor 7 is pretty important, so I'll start there. I like to work on the trumpets first as they can be tricky, and they alter the texture of the sound as they are on top of the voicing, and generally I let them dictate the chord extensions. I'll show you what I mean on this first D minor 7 chord. On a chord like this, the most basic harmonisation would be D minor 7. A, F, D and C. But as I mentioned in my previous big band video, Gill almost always leaves the root note out of the top voices, so in this case he would probably add a ninth. Gill used ninths, elevenths and thirteenths freely, preferring them over roots and fifths in the upper parts especially. Check out these voicings from It Ain't Necessarily So. There is no root note in the upper parts, and there are lots of altered extensions present. So I'll voice this D minor 7 as a D minor 9, A, F, E, C. Then we have the question of how dissonant to make this voicing. As it is, this is completely acceptable. But this is a broad sort of melody, so I think opening up the voicing would be more successful. I'll drop the F down an octave. This shape looks really good. With the fourth trumpet on an F, we get the full chord minus the root, spelled out nicely with a sweet voicing. Gill does use a variety of voicings for his trumpets depending on the sound he was looking for. Here is the same example from It Ain't Necessarily So. Note how the trumpets have a nice open voicing. He could have placed the trumpets in a closed voicing, but instead opened it up for a more expansive sound. And here is an example of a brassy and punchy closed position trumpet voicing from the start of the shout chorus of There's a boat that's leaving soon for New York. Note how the trumpets are placed right up next to each other, well within an octave. Next I like to complete the trombones. If I'm using the bass trombone on the root note, I'll place the bass note first, and then the third and seventh. I'll make sure that these are in a good position, not low or grumbly, and not so high that they have to scream in this simple swinging passage. Then I have a choice of where to put the fourth trombone note. I feel like my options are this A, E, or A up here. I'm less inclined to use E in this instance, as it will accentuate the semitone over this long note. So I'll select this A. I'm not usually too worried about the distance or doubling between the lower trumpets and upper trombones, I think it's more important to get the trombone range right, as they are very powerful and can ruin a texture if they don't sound pleasant on their own, and I can have the saxes fill any inner gaps if needed. And now on to the saxes. It's not a hard and fast rule, but in general, it is a good idea to have the basic harmony represented in the sax section, so that they would sound good and vibrant on their own. As Don Zabeski writes in The Contemporary Arranger, in large ensembles of this kind, the brass should be voiced as a separate entity, and the saxophone section should be added to the brass, giving support where it is needed most, yet voiced in a way which will also enable it to sound complete within itself, while still contributing to the overall ensemble sound. It's also prudent to make sure that if there is a large gap between the trumpets and trombones, that the saxes at least partially fill the space. The tessitura of the melody will usually decide where the first alto sax will play. In lower moments, the first alto can easily double the lead trumpet. As the tessitura rises, the alto is more likely to play an inner part, often the second or third trumpet part. The baritone sax has a few options. 1. It can play the root note of the chord on its own, or double the root with the bass trombone. 2. It can double the melody down an octave. 
or 3, simply play one of the inner parts adding strength when needed. For this voicing, I'll place the alto sax on the 3rd trumpet part, the baritone will double the root with the bass trombone. The remaining saxes will be on the inner parts, making sure someone is reinforcing the melody. If the baritone isn't going to be doubling the melody down an octave, as in this case, I'll usually assign one of the tenor saxes to the melody down an octave. And that is the voicing for that chord completed for the entire big band. This is the sort of thinking I have in the back of my mind as I'm trying to harmonise a passage like Gill. Okay, now it's time for the harmonisation. And as usual, I'll start with the important points, the target chords, and the bass line. So let's start here right at the end with the F. That's going to be nice and strong. And let's do the lead up to it. There's G minors. And I'll try C there. That looks okay. Let's do this G sharp next. Now that's an anticipation for the C7. Let's just put a C on the bottom. Alright, this G minor 7. I want a nice strong G on the bottom. Okay, let's look here to the C major 7. Good strong C there. Let's finish this phrase. I'll put a G on the bottom. Back to the D. Then we'll have something in the C. And that's it for the main points of the melody. Gill generally harmonised passing notes with a new chord. It was often a functional chord or tritone sub or a diatonic chord. Have a look at this example from miles ahead. Each new melody note has a new chord helping to drive the harmony forward. Okay, let's work on some of these passing notes. So yeah, I was just here. I think a D flat would be good there. It could be a tritone sub or something else. And I could do the same over here. D flat 7 to C7. That could work. Okay, I think here it's wise to borrow the A minor and then say the A flat like another tritone sub going to the G. That would be good. That just leaves the very start. Let's have one of these. Flat 7-7, seven, 6-7, seven, seven, then a 2 chord. And that's the bass line done. Alright, let's put on a few of the important voicings or harmonies on the trumpet parts. Start at the end again, F major 7, 5th, 3rd, and of course I'm not going to put on the root note again, I'll put on a ninth. Let's go back here to this G minor 7, put on the 7th, 5th, 3rd, and this is a repeated chord so I can just do the same. Now for this C7 there's a 3rd, I'm going to put a ninth, but I'm going to flatten that ninth, so that trumpet has a bit of a better part to play. And I do have quite a few repeated notes here. Now, I know there's disagreement about repeated notes, but I think in this sort of little bit of passage here, it might be nice for it to move if possible. So I'm actually going to change this G minor 7 to a G7, or G9. And that just gives that fourth trumpet a better part. That's looking good. Okay, I'll do the C7 now. Put in the third, ninth, and flat 7. That looks good. G minor 7, 7th, 5th, 3rd, and like earlier in the D minor 7, might be nice for this to be a more open sound. Put that F down the octave. Yeah, I like the look of that. Okay, C major 7. I'm not going to put in the root here, I'm going to go straight to a 7th, 5th, and then a ninth down there. For the D minor 7, I'll use the same voicing as I did earlier. And here we are onto this G7. I could actually put an F there, there's a minor 3rd between the F and the G sharp, or augmented 2nd. That could work, but I think I like this sort of option better, putting in the augmented 5th, then the 3rd, then the seventh. That's a nice open trumpet voicing. Okay, that's all the main target chords done. I could see I've got some repeated notes in this fourth trumpet part again, although these are longer notes, so it's not as bad. 
I could think about it here when I tackle this D flat 7. I'll try that now. It's got a ninth, flat 7, and there's the third. Yep, it's another F. Okay, I could leave it. Wouldn't be the end of the world. If I did want to change it though, I could try something like this. Put in a minor third, have a double flat 7, so make it a diminished chord basically. Got a minor third, double flat 7, ninth, and flat 5th. And for these sort of little options, you need to try each one out and see what you like best. That's a personal taste thing. Okay, I'll do the other D flat 7, or D flat chord. Flat 9th, 7th, and 5th. That looks good. Okay, I'll tackle this A minor. A minor, there's the 3rd, 7th, and then I can put in a 9th, so it's A minor 9. And here I have an A flat 13 chord of some sort. There's my 3rd, it's my 7th. So here I do have a repeated note, the C, C, D. It's not too bad. Um, here's another option. I have my 9th back. I could put in the 5th there, and then the 3rd. That way each part is moving. We do have a momentary major second at the top of that voicing. And I'm actually okay with that. Uh, mostly because it resolves, and I think it would sound fine in this instance. I'll leave it like that. Okay, here we go to the A7 augmented. Let's have a third, and a seventh. And let's put in a ninth, B flat seven, ninth, flat seven, and third. And that's the completed harmony. I do have a few options if I'd like to make some of the voicings more open. I could drop this F by an octave. But because there's a bit of movement in that phrase, I think I, I like it how it is. I could do the same here. But this little phrase, it's sort of punchy and snappy. So it's nice with the trumpets up there, nice and tight together. And here's what that sounds like. Okay, now that I've got the basic harmony in there, I can add the trombones. And I'll utilize the same extensions that I have done in the top harmony. For instance, with this C7 flat 9, I won't put a natural 9 in the trombones, it'll be very crunchy. Okay, I like to start with the target chords again. So, onto this F. I have a third, and a seventh, and I think a fifth will be nice there. I work on the C7, flat 7, 3rd, let's have a flat 9. Okay, G9. We've got options here. I could go for this 3rd, that 5th, that 7th, and let's have that 5th. That looks pretty good. I do have a repeated note here from this E to E. I could go up to the 5th if I really want to stop that, or... Move it down an octave. That's a bit grumbly for me there, I don't like that. I'll leave it like that for now. Okay, I'll do the C augmented 9. Seventh, third. Got options here, I could go down to my ninth or up to that G sharp. I think I'll go up. It's a nice jaunty moment. Seventh, ninth, third. That's all looking good. Okay, G minor 9. Third. 7th, let's go for the ninth there, that's looking good, ok I'm going to go back to the C major 7, 7th, 3rd, let's go for the ninth. Uh, this D minor we already did earlier, and the same voicing here, ok let's look at this G, augmented 7th, let's have the 3rd, 7th, Okay, similar to before, I could go down to the E flat, or I could have the first trombone play G sharp. I'll go down to the E flat this time. 
Okay, just some of the passing chords now. Let's do this D flat diminished. Double flat seven, third, and flat five. Okay, A minor nine, third, seventh, let's put the fifth in there too. A flat thirteen, third, fifth, flat seven. I've got a repeated C, but that C does resolve down to the B flat. I'm going to leave it like that for now. I think it works okay in that phrase. Okay, to the start, A augmented ninth, third, seventh, put in the augmented fifth, B flat nine, third, seventh, and let's put in the sharp eleventh there. And that's the trombones done. I've made sure to include the third and seventh on each chord so it's nice and solid. And I've tried to keep them in a good range. There's varying amount of overlap with the trumpets, but I think that's fine. Here's what it sounds like. Sorry about the nasty midi, by the way. Okay, now it's time for the saxophones. I'll put in that voicing I did earlier with the alto on the third trumpet part. And I've got the baritone doubling the bass trombone, which isn't always typical, and I've got the other saxes on the inner parts. Now I want to make sure one of these saxes is doubling the melody down an octave. So I'm going to do that now. That way I know the melody will be being reinforced by at least one of the saxes. And I want the baritone sax to double the bass trombone, so I'm going to put that part in now. Okay, now it's time for the other saxes. And again, I like to tackle the target chords first. Let's have a look at this last chord. I'm going to put in the ninth, the third there. Still got one more note to add. Could happily put in the C. That'd be fine, it all sits in a really nice range. The chord's completed, or at least vibrant on its own. Back to the C7. I think I'll try that for that chord. That looks pretty good for the G9. Notice how the saxophones are, are sitting nicely in the middle in a comfortable area with their nice vibrant voicings. They'd sound good on their own. C7, G minor 9. Now I'm not sure about this voicing. I think I'll put that B flat down an octave. Yeah, I think that will sound better. With the B flat up here, I am accentuating that minor second by quite a lot, just in the one section. Okay, back to the C major 7. G7. Now that is quite a tight voicing there, but I feel like it should be alright. D minor 9, same as before. Okay, now just a few passing chords left to do. Let's have a look at this A minor. The 7th in, 9th, 3rd, 7th. Okay, I'm going to alter these so they all have a bit of a better voice leading. I'm going to drop that B an octave, and that C an octave as well. I like that better. Okay, D flat 7, 7th, 9th, 5th. Now with this voicing I've got my D on repeat. I could move something by an octave. I'll do that. I like that voicing better anyway. It's going to sound better with the 7th. Nice in that solid range. Just the first couple to go now. 9th, 3rd, 7th, 3rd, 7th, and there's the 9th. Alright, D flat diminished, put the 3rd there, double flat 7, and there's the 9th. Now I made this D flat diminished chord to avoid some repeated notes, but in this voicing, I've got a repeated E and E. And that sometimes happens. 
It could be a part where those players swap notes, or I could alter the voicing. What if I did this? Each part now moves. It's not too bad. But the voicing should sound good on its own. Oops, I missed my B flat there. And that's the saxes done. I put the saxes onto separate staves so I could have a good look at the voice leading. And I thought the end could be improved slightly, so I changed it to this. That looks pretty good. And here is what it all sounds like together. Thanks for watching the video and let me know what you think of this method of voicing for big band. Do you do something similar? If you need to look at the score on paper, you can purchase the PDF. The link is in the description.